So uh, yeah, encounter was the story um, around around the privacy idea of of uh, Substrate. So that that was what I proposed to the Web three Foundation. And now we are. Um, that was one year ago, more or less. And now we are at a stage where we where we are ready to open up to the to the Substrate community. Um, well, it was able, you, you could play around with it before, but I think now we are at the point where you can really use it for your, for your own uh, ideas. So now, now it should be user friendly enough for you to, and feature complete so, so that you can uh, develop your own palettes inside, inside Substrate T and, and I will show you today how, how that works. So yeah, Renzi, I've got a question for you already, and sure, it sounds sure. it sounds much better, by the way. Thanks for okay. Testing. So so, what is Supercomputing Systems? Is that your your company that's building Substrate and in Coiner? Exa exactly, exactly. Supercomputing Systems is uh, maybe that didn't come through because of the audio. Um, is an engineering service provider. We are 130 um, people here in uh, all engineers here in Zurich. Um, and and we we do software and hardware design um, for for our customers. So we don't actually have our own products. We just do custom custom solutions. This can be public transport, port, uh, television, or or uh, medical or energy sector. And I myself, I kind of grew out of the energy sector and and uh, could start my own my own department uh, two years ago with kind of the decentralized idea. So blockchain and trusted execution, mainly in the domain for energy, but yeah, so that's, that's more or less the, the background of the company. Company is 25 years old, so not a startup anymore. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks. Hey, and, and that reminded me, um, I, we, Brenzi and I were talking right before we started and he's totally comfortable with the normal seminar format of like, just come off mute and interrupt with, with questions, right? Does that still, that sounds good? Yeah, please do that because I, I think it's easier to understand uh, the, the slides if you, if you understood the previous ones. Cool. cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. So I, I have a question about yes, the... Uh, so the, the connection between Encointer and uh, Supercomputing Systems. Uh, Supercomputing Systems is, is a consultancy where you work. That's your day job. That's my uh, day job. And Encointer and is Encointer is the work of passion. Job. Or, <laughs> got it, got it. Cool. It, it. It's my night job. And by now, well, it's, it's kind of a win-win because, uh, well, it's, it really overlaps. But, but for me, it's now a win-win because with the Encointer association that we founded i could now uh, contract supercomputing systems to do to to accelerate the, the work because i sweet I, i'm not fast enough if i do everything myself <laughs> yeah so so that's kind of the deal so so my my person is the link between encounter and substrate and scs cool. is also working for encounter so that's kind of the, the link thank you Good. So let's dig in. Um, what are we trying to do with Substrate? Our ambition is uh, big. We want to solve the main challenges of blockchain today. So here's the sales pitch. We can we can uh, solve confidentiality, scalability, and interoperability. Um, obviously, this comes with certain assumptions, but um, First, confidentiality. Um, the, the big issue there is um, if you today would like to implement uh, uh, an enterprise use case on the blockchain, that is a big challenge because of GDPR and other laws. Uh, I think California has, a, has an equally uh, challenging privacy law. Um, and the, the, the main issue is that uh, well, blockchains, especially public blocks, blockchains, um, they 
at, at their base, they are they are a, a technology that enhances transparency and not and not privacy. Um, there are solutions like Zcash, Monero, and so on, but they are kind of they also come at the price. They have larger transactions. They have uh, let's say cutting edge research uh, algorithms which are not yet uh, production ready for general use. I would say. Um, and the other solution that you have is actually have private blockchains, uh, like like uh, a lot of uh, groups in the banking sector are are doing it. But I I seriously question that approach because then then I wonder why are you using blockchain at all? Um, so what we are kind of linking is we, we would like to have public unpermissioned blockchains but take all the user data and all the confidential data off chain um, in the sense that that the, the blockchain is just the root of trust and uh, all the data remains inside uh, protected enclaves i'll i'll like go into that approach in at length um, scalability that's another thing um, which we cannot yet deliver with what we have now, but it's it's on our roadmap. Because we take execution of smart contracts off chain, well, execution of any kind of, of uh, transfer, um, we actually build a second layer technology. And if we, I will, I will show you um, how the concept will look like to, to achieve scalability through that interoperability is another angle um, that we also proposed in a, in a in a web3 uh, grant but that hasn't gone through unfortunately uh, because if you if you build bridges um, you can leverage the the integrity guarantees of trusted execution environments and i will i will not go into that today but but I will, I will show you how, how we instantiate light clients inside trusted execution environments um, and therefore can, can link two chains um, and, and have transfers with, with um, integrity. So, okay, I, I already dropped that uh, phrase uh, quite a few times. Uh, trusted execution environments, that's what we use um, as, as a core tool. Um, today, we use Intel SGX, which is, let's say, the most production ready solution. And actually, today, it's the only solution that fulfills our, all our requirements. Um, of course, there is a trust in Intel um, if we do that. So, Intel. Um, the promise of Intel is integrity, so that uh, code is executed correctly as, as it is um, intended, and also with confidentiality, so that the, the data which is processed is kept confidential, also kept confidential from the administrator of the system. Now, these two uh, promises... I ask? Yes. Sorry. Um, what what is your opinion about trusted trusted zone? Is that the R, R, trust arm zone. Arm, arm arm trust zone? Um, on trust zone and the A and the AMD, the new Zen two, and I don't know if you yeah. have any information about the Zen three. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, there there are alternatives. Um, the problem that we have, especially with trust zone, that's the one that we have looked into quite uh, quite for a while. Um, the problem is they don't give us remote attestation. I will, mm -hmm. let, me, let me go two, two slides further and then we can reiterate on this discussion why, why this is uh, important. Um, okay, so for now you can just uh, assume this, this all works with in, Intel SGX and the others are on the roadmap but um, not yet feasible. Okay, but at the core, what, a tr what is a trusted execution environment? 
Um, we are very used to the fact that um, system administrators can access whatever they want on a machine. So who in, in, in the companies where we work, uh, our, our IT admins, they, they can do what they want. They can see what we are doing, they can change uh, memory, they can uh, they are the complete master of the machine. Um, and the same, unfortunately, applies to malware because when malware can somehow achieve um, admi administrative uh, privileges, it can do the same. So that's, that's kind of the, the issue of, um, of all the viruses and that, that we have. And what, what uh, T's do actually, they, they isolate the execution of, of, uh, of a program such that the system administrator can, all, all the administrator can do is start or stop um, that, that process, but it cannot look into the process what it is doing. And, and this, guarantee, this is guaranteed by hardware. So there is in the CPU, there, there are, um, that, that there is a design that prevents um, the operating system to, to see what is happening there. So the process works on encrypted memory and um, is executed. So with Intel SGX, it's a bit special. It works a bit different than the other T's. Um, so it's actually just new instructions that they that they uh, implemented in the CPU that changes the mode in which uh, pro processes are executed. So actually what you do is you, you load a, a library and that library is, is uh, um, and, and enters in, in this uh, protected mode and whatever the library does will operate on encrypted memory and we can also be sure about the hash of the binary of that library so whatever so the library is the enclave i will talk about the enclave uh, from now on um, you can load the enclave execute the enclave and you can have an attestation on your system what the code is that is executed um, and that, that is, a, so with, with this, we get confidentiality and integrity. We know that it is the correct code. We also know that no one sees the data. And the additional feature of that is that the Enclave can have its own keys. So the Enclave can have uh, a blockchain account. The Enclave can have uh, a symmetric key, which is used to uh, encrypt things. It can have an asymmetric key which uh, can be used to send data to the enclave uh, in encrypted form such that only the enclave can decrypt it. So, so I've, got a, I've got a question about that. That's yeah. it. Like if I buy a new CPU that has one of these uh, TEEs in it, like yeah. somewhere in the manual or something, there's a public key and I know as a user that like if I want to send data into this TEE, I can encrypt it to this particular public key and is, is that it, like the design? It, it's not, it's not so simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, SGX is built into every Intel CPU, well, all, all the uh, i3, i5, i7, and, and so since the, since the sixth generation, so probably in your machines, if, if it's an Intel, then you have SGX. Um, but not all the, the biases um, support it. So you, it kind of, you, you need the right mainboard also. Um, and then you can execute this enclave and the enclave generates its key by itself and stores these keys to the file system in a sealed form such that only the enclave can, can uh, open it again. So that's, that's about how it works. And the next process is a remote attestation and, and but I, I will come I will come to that um, maybe, so maybe it's worth mentioning that the uh, 
uh, there are two keys that are stored inside the CPU and they are, they, they are put there at, at the Intel factories. Yes, yes. And so that is- hardware keys and they're, they're sort of soldered onto the CPU. Yes, yeah. They are hardwired. And that's what Intel uses for remote attestation. So Intel can in the field identify their own devices. Well, not uh, identify, they can just prove that they are genuine, kind of. It's not, they have, their, their protocol is meant to support privacy so that you, the idea is that they cannot identify, or that at least, well, I, I, I should, I think we have the time to go a bit deeper on that. So um, actually Intel SGX by design is meant for, diff, not really for the use case that we are using it. What they, what they would like to do is for example, a DRM uh, solution for content delivery. So. You have a, a vendor, let's say Netflix, and they want to be sure that only uh, subscribed users can play the video and that the video cannot be recorded. So one solution is uh, use SGX for this. So the user must have an SGX platform. Um, the vendor Netflix will ask Intel if that user has a genuine Intel SGX platform, um, and then the S uh, and then uh, the video will be provided in an encrypted form that only the the, the enclave can decrypt, and then uh, you can you can um, see the video. So that kind of is the other direction because in. What Substrat wants to do, we want to convince the whole world that actually that somebody who, who executes our code on Intel SGX executes it on a genuine device and executes the correct build. And so that's kind of the other way around. But in the case of content delivery, it it is kind of it, it is important that net that Netflix cannot identify um, the machine itself, or or that's kind of the the, the promise of of this of this uh, elaborate remote attestation protocol. We would actually prefer something else. If uh, I, will, I will later, uh, maybe we can cover this as well. We would actually prefer that the hardware is uniquely identifiable by all by by everybody. Um, because then we could go even further with with the trust uh, assumptions that, that that we have. But is that is that clear, or, or do, do you have more questions to that? Yeah, I'm curious uh, to find out more why you want um, these the the TEs to be identifiable. Okay, um, well one. One interesting use case would be fee-less transactions. If, if, if T's are identifiable, then we could give quotas to the T's on how many uh, transactions that they, may, that they may proxy to the chain, for example. Um, and then if you, if, you wanna, if you want to send a transaction, either you find someone who, who sends the transaction for you, who runs a T, or um, you could just run your own T and send and send your transactions, but with Intel SGX that doesn't work because SGX cannot prevent that you instantiate multiple enclaves on the same machine. So you have no way of identifying uh, kind of cyber enclaves, and that's that's kind of by design from Intel. That's that's how they want it. Um, but it's it's not perfect for our use case. We are, we are right now looking into ways how we could do um, remote attestation. For example, for for ARM Trust Zone, um, so where shortly saying you want to have identifiable hardware. Yes. And could you compare uh, TEE with secure element? Um, yes, well, you can, se secure elements are, 
have have limited possibility of of having uh, generic execution so but they are very limited in in in, in that sense mm -hmm. um, but secure elements could well could help um, the problem is that tpms do not help because um, well, now, now we are already digging quite deep there, but <laughs> if, if that's of interest to you, we can continue. Um, the, the problem is, let's say we have an ARM CPU, which has Trust Zone, and then we have a TPM, which makes that platform uh, identifiable. The problem is that you only know that the, if you remote attest that hardware, all you know is that the TPM is genuine, but someone could resolder the arm cpu and put a fake cpu there which which kind of has a backdoor to the trust zone um, and you couldn't you couldn't see that mm -hmm. so that's that's why just using a secure or just using a, a tpm uh, doesn't do the trick uh, yeah, and I, and, I got the idea thank you okay okay um, I, have, I have one question about about the uh the DRM use case that was sort of yeah. driving the development of SGX back in almost 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, do, do you know if this is actually deployed today? Is there anyone actually using this in their video players or whatnot? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, because I've seen this use case presented and then, and then I, I'm not actually aware of anyone. Yeah, it, I think it, it seems like it's almost it didn't pan out. They wanted to build it for that, but nobody wanted to use it. Yeah, but I think well, luckily DRM is somewhat of a of a millennial or millennium phenomenon, and it fortunately right. died out uh, because 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 the industry realized that that it's kind of well that usability should be first, um, and I, I think that's also the reason why. I mean, Netflix found other ways to to make it really hard for you to <laughs> kind of uh, avoid paying for the subscription, um, which which I never looked at in detail. But it's just, um, yeah. So I actually, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know if there is a, is a content delivery, a video on demand kind of thing that, that uses SGX. Yeah, it's almost like a cool point in history where, you know, this, this stack was developed for DRM and then it never was, that never was used. And now we're taking this thing that was developed for something like DRM and using it for something like blockchain. Yes, <laughs> kind of yes. And, 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 and I mean, it is, it is not a perfect fit how, how the remote attestation is designed. Um, because as I said, if, if I mean, the, 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 the way, very, the, the, the simplified best way, I think would be that we have a manufacturer that we trust that um, has a, a physically unclonable function on its device so that you can even be sure that even the hardware manufacturer doesn't know the key. It can only kind of derive uh, derive a public key from it or, or a key pair from it. Um, so, so I mean, physic physically unclonable functions are just kind of you 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 use the limits of of production um, uh, accuracy in in, uh, in 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 CPUs. Or, or in silicon, um, and you use that to create an, uh, a unique uh, uh, fingerprint of, of your of your device, and then you from that fingerprint you can derive um, a key pair. And if you then if then the manufacturer would take the public key and write that public key into the blockchain, uh, certifying that that device is genuine. That would be very nice in our use case because then we don't even need Intel attestation services to be online. We could just look it up in the blockchain and we know, okay, that manufacturer signed with, 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 his, with his certificate um, or, or kind of signed the certificate for, for that, for that uh, hardware. Um, and, and we could use classical PKI for this uh, to, to kind of be as compatible <laughs> as possible with, with kind of standard provisioning procedures. 
and we are we are actually currently looking into this option with distributors if if they would be uh, because the manufacturers seem not to be interested because arm trust zone as as intel has the case of drm which is not substrate use case arm trust zone has yet another use case because arm trust zone is more or less meant to protect the user which has the device in its hand like a mobile phone so you you want you want to build a hardware where you can you can use a fingerprint to unlock things but you can be sure that the operating system cannot directly access the fingerprint sensor um, so so that's what our trust zone was built for and it, it was never meant to to be remotely attestable so I, I i never want my phone to convince someone else than myself that it is a genuine arm trust zone uh, plot platform so again it's also trusted execution but it's meant for a different use case all right sh shall we move on or do you have uh, further questions yeah let's keep moving sounds good okay 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 so um the idea well, which I think I think we <laughs> I said it already uh, is is that you have a blockchain, but the people are not directly executing their transactions or sending the transactions to the blockchain and having them executed on chain. Instead, the chain is only there to to provide a a trusted registry of attested hardware. So we have a T, the T needs to convince the blockchain that it is genuine by uh, requesting remote attestation from Intel, SG, uh, from Intel attestation services. And from then on, we know um, that the account which, re so, well, when it does that, when, when it provides its remote attestation, it, it already has generated a blockchain account. So a key pair, which it uses to sign that attestation. So from then on, whatever is uh, signed by this account, you can be sure that it is signed by an enclave. Um, and therefore, you can you can um, establish trust in in what that what that worker does. Now, the the end goal is that people can now interact with the worker directly without hitting the chain at all. But that's not yet where we are today. Today we have an indirect invocation. Um, the reason for that is that we don't have a uh, sorting uh, protocol yet. Because if we have multiple workers working for the same use case, for the same DAP, um, then we need to have deterministic ordering of transactions. I mean, that's one of the things that the blockchain is really good at. Um, it, can, it can deliver global consensus on the order of transactions. Um, and so as a first step, that's what we do. Uh, we, we have the people send their transactions to the blockchain. They are proxied by the blockchain into the T's um, are executed there and the T's send a confirmation back to the chain. Um, now, we, we, we talked about confidentiality, so whatever you'd send to the chain is actually encrypted, but, uh, but let, me, let me use another slide to go deeper on that. Now, one important aspect here is whatever runs, whatever uh, is executed, needs to be open source because otherwise you could do whatever you could you could leak all the secrets directly uh, to the operator of the worker so the idea here is that the the code which we execute is open source and that we can have a deterministic build because what the manufacturer attests to us is a that the hardware is genuine and b what is the hash of the binary which is executed on on that genuine machine and now if we don't have deterministic builds we again have to trust someone to provide that binary 
and of course we could we could dig deep and see if that binary is indeed produced from that code but the the, the, the easiest thing is a deterministic build um yes this is already a problem we have in the substrate space with on yes upgrades yes yeah, it's like, yes yeah yeah you want to you want to say something to that yoshi or, uh, I mean, I'm just noticing that it's, uh, you know, the same problem that's cropped up even apart from using the, the T's. So, I mean, like, I, basically, anytime we're going to do a runtime upgrade, someone proposes, hey, here's a new runtime I'd like to upgrade to, let's vote on it. And you, you have no way to make an informed vote unless you yep. see, you know, like, to be informed, you read the sort code and you say, like, okay, yeah, this does something that I think is good, I vote for it. Or, like, no, this runtime is not healthy for our chain, like, I vote against it. But if you don't have a deterministic build, then you're reading some code and there's some binary and you have no way to know whether the thing you're actually yeah. voting on is the code you read. So yeah, yeah. just the same yeah. problem. So again, what you can do is some kind of a um, multi-party agreement uh, that they, yeah. But it's, it's um, Rust by itself is not yet uh, capable to to guarantee deterministic builds, as far as I know. Um, it's not. It's work in progress, and it's a it, it's a it, hard problem. Apparently, it is. Yeah. It is a hard problem. But I yeah. think. Well, I believe. Have you, have you come up with a solution or workaround for this, or or? No. No. no, I mean this is this is kind of the concept, but we well we 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 never have been in the situation yet uh, that it was someone else than us uh, <laughs> making the binary and trying to convince us. So so we are not at that stage of maturity. There's a tool in the ecosystem. I, I don't know specifically like enough about your use case here, Brenzi. Hope maybe we will in the next little bit, but. For the runtime upgrades, there's this tool called SR tool, which basically is just like an engineering solution where we just, you know, it's a Docker image that is a whole yeah. build environment. Yeah, and it's exactly. Like, yeah. We don't have real serious deterministic builds, but as long as everyone agrees that this is the one build environment that <laughs> we like kind of do in some sense. Exactly. That, that's what you can do today. You can, you can have a very controlled build environment, which is... Uh, as reproducible as it gets and and uh, and, and yeah um, okay but i mean that that is kind of if 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 you want to really take the, the trust from a to z then then that's what you need deterministic build um, okay so how does this in, indirect invocation actually work um, I hope you can see my mouse pointer because we will spend some time on this slide. Yeah, um, okay, so let's imagine we have a, um, yeah, one, one example that we delivered was a, a tr uh, private transaction. So we, we want to transact tokens privately. So we have the requester, Alice, who wants to send tokens to Bob without anyone else um, knowing who transacted how much to whom. And so what, what she does is she creates a call, a tr we call it a trusted call, which she signs with a different identity that she uses on chain. So she has one account, uh, we call it incognito account, that she uses on, 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 on the trust side, on the confidential side, and another account that she uses to send these transactions to the chain. She can use different identities or whatever, or mixing. Well, no, mi well, no, no mixing. It's, I mean, there is, there is, of course, a leak of information if we have indirect uh, invocation. But Let's leave that aside for now. Um, so Alice sends a transaction to the chain. We have a, a pallet, uh, one uh, Substrate T uses exactly one pallet which serves two purposes. One is registering workers, worker enclaves, and the other one is kind of forwarding, forwarding transactions. So this is a call to that to that pallet. On chain, there might be other pallets as well. We can we can go into that later. Um, so then we have 
that that's all on the node. And here you don't see anything of that transaction because the key which is used to encrypt this transaction comes from the T and only the T can decrypt it. Um, I will go in, so into Al the- Alice uses, uses is the uh, public key from the enclave to encrypt her extrinsic. Exactly. But okay, not, so... but not, not the public key, uh, not from the account, because the account is is um, the enclave has an ED uh, two fifty five nineteen um, mm -hmm. account, which it which it only uses to sign uh, transactions uh, and messages, well, whatever messages, and and it also has an R an RSA key pair which is used for asymmetric uh, encryption. Um, and the public key, that public key is, is kind of published by the worker with the signature of, of, the, of the enclaves signing key. So we, we talk about the shielding key. The shielding key is the, is the RSA key that is used to encrypt calls. And the signing key is the, the private key of the enclave's account, which is uh, ED, an, an, an ED key. Um, but, but sorry, if I this is a dumb question, but what ahead. what key does Alice use to encrypt her transaction? Okay, let me. I, I have another here? slide to to show you this. Um, we have. Um, All right. So, the the shielding key is. I let let me say this. We will have various workers because we need redundancy, right? Um, because if we have keys in an enclave and that hardware uh, smokes uh, or goes offline or whatever, then everything is lost because no one else has that key. So, to prevent that, we need redundancy. Um, so multiple workers are executing exactly the same calls at the same time. Um, and that shielding key is, is a secret that is shared among all these worker enclaves. Um, because if everyone needs to be able to execute the calls, everyone, every, everyone needs to have the key to decrypt them. So Alice has, again, she has a hidden or an incognito key which she uses to sign her call, to authenticate her call, and then she encrypts the call to, um, uh, well, yeah, to, to obfuscate it. Um, and then she sends it to the chain, then it goes to the enclave where it is decrypted, where it is authenticated, and then the call is executed. But if you have for the whole crypto thing, I have a better slide, so we can we can go deeper on that, um, and and that's that's the two slides which which go a bit deeper. But let me first close the cycle of what is actually happening. Um, so the the call is now on chain. Um, the worker is is actually two things we have an untrusted side of the, of the worker which is just the application that that uh, that is uh, started and the trusted side which is the enclave which is a library that that untrusted application is loading um, so what the the worker the untrusted app does it operates a chain relay so it just takes the most recent blocks and forwards them to the enclave. So usually on the same node where you have a worker running, you also run a substrate node. So you also run a blockchain node and you query directly uh, that node uh, for, for the new headers. Um, then we have a light client built into the, into the enclave. That light client takes the new blocks, can, uh, can, can uh, verify all the proofs, like the, the grandpa finality um, and inclusion proofs of transactions. And it keeps 
it keeps its own database with uh, block headers. So it's, it's a light client, it only stores block headers. But it processes entire blocks. So it's not only, um, it's, it's not only uh, getting, getting the, the headers, it's getting the entire blocks because it needs to extract the extrinsics. Then it, it scans every block for calls to that, to that proxy function that we have here in this palette. Um, and if there is a new call coming in, it will decrypt that call with the shielding key, the shielding private key. It will authenticate the call uh, by comparing the, the uh, kind of the, the from address to the to the signature of the call. So we, if we have from Alice to Bob a uh, hundred a hundred tokens, um, then it will actually. Uh, verify that the from address is the one that has signed the, the call. Um, and then it goes to what we call the state transition function. That's a very generic term. Um, actually, this is just your business logic. And we thought it is a nice idea if the business logic is actually exactly the same has the same interface as substrate palettes and i think that's that's the the the, the real strength of of substrate t um, you can you can develop your palettes here on your nodes and at a certain point decide okay i need privacy for that palette and then you instantiate just that very palette inside the stf and and you have you have privacy more or less with with a few with a few lines of code. Um, so I wanted to ask about like you've got yep. palette A and B in one place here, and palette C and D in another. Yeah. Am I understanding correctly that palettes A and B are sort of like regular old substrate palettes on a regular old substrate node, not encrypted or whatever? But then exactly. D, I mean, I guess like from the palette author's perspective, palette C and D are also normal palettes, but absolutely instantiated inside of the T or something. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I, will, I will walk you through. Um, so one, once we went through the, the, the slides here, I'd like to walk you through what we did for Encointer because Encointer's first testnet was uh, a, a plain substrate chain with four pallets. And, but the Encounter use case needs privacy for two of these three pallets, uh, four pallets. And so what we did is we took these two uh, pallets, put, put them in Substrate. Well, that's actually what we are doing right now. The, the, the milestone is on Friday, so. <laughs> but we, we are pretty, pretty uh, far already. So I can, show you, I can show you how easy it is to, to use Substrate for this. Um, but and and there is more because pallets they interact if they are on chain one pallet can query the state of another pallet and what we what we just recently delivered um a, a week ago is the functionality that now pallet c can or pallet d can actually interact with with pallet b so it can read the on-chain storage of pallet b and because we have a light client, we can we can uh, we can verify read proofs, and we can be sure that that is really the state of of that palette. But now we're already going uh, far. So let, let's let's stay simple for now. For now, we would assume that there that these don't exist. So so that ours is the only palette uh, on this chain besides uh, uh, transaction payment. And, and, um, uh, and there is only a balance palette here in, in the STF. So that's what we did for that example. The, this palette C would just be the balance palette, um, keeping a private ledger. So um, the call that Alice sent is now processed by the balance palette. And when that is successful, um, the enclave will sign a confirmation. And this confirmation includes the hash of the call and the hash of the updated state. 
uh, this will be sent to the chain and as soon as it is finalized on chain, Alice can prove to Bob that that call has been processed. But another way how Bob could know that this actually happens is by just querying his own balance on chain, uh, on chain, uh, on on the on on the confidential storage, and that's why we have another another API here. Um, so this time Bob is the client. It will send a authenticated getter function, which is just get state, get my balance. Um, to a WebSocket uh, interface that, that we provide from, from the worker's side. And that call is also encrypted because we don't want the worker to know or, or someone sniffing on the network um, uh, what, what actually Bob is querying. Um, the enclave is authenticating it, well, also decrypting and authenticating. Uh, and then it, it reads the storage and returns returns the, the value and obviously we need to sign the returned value with the enclaves key when we need to encrypt it with a public key uh, provided over here so if you if you if you have if you call the getter you need to to let the enclave know how you intend to uh, <laughs> decrypt uh, the message afterwards um so okay. what, what Paul gets back is an encrypted payload and then he yes. can he has he, to decrypt it himself yes yes he has to decrypt it first bob has to decrypt the payload and then it has to uh well here the order doesn't matter uh, and that it also has to verify uh, that it is signed by an enclave mm -hmm. that he must trust that he must trust Got exactly it. but and it, does, how, it doesn't how does matter. he share keys with the with the enclave how does he how does he share keys with the enclave oh oh okay um, i mean there there are there are several ways one one way how we can do that because that that functionality is is not yet really materially finalized we an, an easier way to do is we can have a a uh, ssl connection directly into the enclave and then you can have just usual key agreement uh, and, and an ssl connection um that that could do the trick but the way we would do it now is you you just with the call you supply your public key which will then be used by the enclave to encrypt your your uh, balance but that's that that is really something it's it's an open issue um that that kind of the return path here is is uh, really uh, ideally he bob should do remote attestation on the enclave, I guess. Um, that is not necessary because okay. the enclave has sent, has re registered with Substrate T e, and this palette is capable of uh, uh, verifying the certificate from Intel attestation ser uh, services. Well, not only the certificate, it can, it can also parse the, the, the quote the report on that enclave so you the the blockchain even knows if 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 the sgx platform is up to date if it is patched with the latest security mm -hmm. patches and it is up to the to kind of the chain governance to to um, enforce um, what kind of of requirements you would like to have because r right now we 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 are operating in uh, debug mode which means actually right now we don't provide privacy at all because you can you can you can attach a debugger to the enclave um but there there are there are certain uh, difficulties we we did run it in production mode as well um but it's just it, it's it's for now it's too much work and it's too hard for people to to try it out because if you really want to want to run intel sgx in production mode you need a commercial license with intel um and that is for free but it is a little bit uh, bureaucratic um we did that we we obtained no i tried it it's tricky 
it's a lot of work to get it to work and to, for yeah. all the endpoints yeah. to be happy. I, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, I mean, the, the vision of Substrate is that there are a few entities, legal entities, who obtain a, a, uh, a commercial license with Intel. But from then on, it's kind of a non-permissioned network. Everybody who is able to get a commercial license with Intel and has, has an SGX hardware can actually start working as a worker. And 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 that's that's why we that's why we say it's actually a non-permissioned a non-permissioned network. It's not strictly true because there is Intel uh, which permissions. <laughs> so in, Intel can decide who who joins, but their policy is I would say quite liberal. You need you need to be a legal entity and you may not work for the army. So that's kind of the that's kind of the two the two conditions that they have. Um, okay, where have we been? So, okay, now we can send calls, we can, uh, we can request state, and everything is encrypted and authenticated. Um, now, I, I have a dumb question here okay. on, the, on this slide. I, I think I understand the architecture of having, having uh, all that stuff inside the enclave. For this specific case of, of private balance transfers, is it true that you could have gone away, gotten away with uh, less code inside the enclave, like having the like client verify the proofs and, and just send over the encrypted yes. payloads yes, into the absolutely. enclave and do the signing in there and you know, yeah. just keep it that, really, really tiny? That, that is a very smart remark. Uh, that's what we actually did uh, for our first milestones. We didn't have a light client at first, but we did have private transactions. The reason why we need uh, the light client is if we want to interact with the chain or if we want to, to do something uh, similar to Zcash. Zcash has public accounts, then you can do a shielding transaction which moves funds from public accounts into the pool of, of, uh, of uh, dark accounts. Then you can transact in the dark accounts privately. And at some point in time, you can do an unshielding transaction to get your funds out of that dark uh, pool. Um, we can do the same now. Before, before we had the light client, the state of, of the, the, the confidential state was completely isolated from on-chain state. There was no trusted way to read on-chain state and uh, vice versa. So on-chain on couldn't <laughs> access the other state, obviously, um, which is the whole point. Um, and now that we have a light client, we can actually send... Um, funds on chain to a bonding account which only the enclave can spend uh, it's 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 actually a bit like a bridge it's it's actually it's it's a very similar protocol to to chain bridges um, you you send uh, tokens to the bonding account and then because you do that the enclave can uh, verify the inclusion proof of that transaction and can issue uh, dark pool accounts for you uh, funds, funds for you. So in this design, it's basically like palette A is one instance of the balances palette. That's the like public, like this, like yes. some people call them like surveillance tokens. And then palette C is another instance of balances, like the exact same palette, but these are the dark tokens. And then absolutely. It, yeah, okay. So absolutely. how would you, how would you un, like, I think shielding is pretty straightforward. Like I make that transaction in palette A, it's verified yep. by the light client, etc. So how do I unshield? Like how does... How does Palette A know that it's safe to mint some new like surveillance tokens because the dark tokens have been burned or whatever? Um, you're not actually minting because you give if you if you do shielding, you you kind of give custody of the tokens to the enclave. So mm -hmm. you send it to the bonding account, and the bonding account is controlled by by the enclave. Uh, or, or buy all the enclaves together for, for that same use case. Um, and the enclave so is issuing fresh, so, so let's start at zero. Um, <clears throat> 
we have we have uh, 100 on-chain tokens and zero off-chain tokens. Uh, now we send 50 on-chain tokens to that bonding account. The Enclave will mint 50 off-chain tokens, uh, which you then can spend. And if you unshield it, it will burn those 50 tokens and send, uh, release the, the 50 on-chain tokens on your account. So that's, that's kind of the whole circle. That last step of the link of the circle is the one I'm not clear on. Like, so let's say I've, I'm ready to unshield some of my tokens, like pallet C burns those tokens. How does the message get back to pallet A of like, hey, send these from the bonding account back to Joshi's account or, or whatever? Like, is okay, that an okay, okay. transaction? Or? Um, well, let me see if I can, be, be, because this, this is actually exactly the, the example that we have for our last milestone. Let me dig that up. Um, okay, can you can you see the sequence diagram? Yeah. Okay, so you have Alice, you have the chain, which is our palette, um, the substrate registry, and then you have the worker, which is untrusted, and the enclave, which is trusted. So, as as I said previously, we have Alice. Alice has a hundred tokens on chain. Uh, and, she, and she has two identities. She has an on-chain identity, which is AOC, and she has a, an incognito identity, which is AIC, um, on the shard. Um, and I, I'll go into sharding later. Let's let's uh, because Substrate can also do sharding, um, but that that will uh, be too complicated right for 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 this here. Um, and we have a bonding account, which is controlled by the enclaves, which is EOC. So what Alice does first is she sends an extrinsic saying uh, shield funds. Uh, and, and that's, and that's a, 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 a transparent extrinsic because our palette needs to be able to read it. And what it will do, it, it will call the balance palette and say transfer from AOC to EOC 50. Um, and that's it for that palette. It will not do more than that. But the, the enclave is actually the chain, the, the, the light client um, in the enclave will scan all the blocks for exactly these shield funds extrinsics. And if it finds a shield fund extrinsic, it will um, uh, wait. Well, it will decrypt AIC and I, AI. Well, yeah, that that is that's what I forgot to say. The shield funds is signed by Alice with her public identity, um, but she sends her incognito identity in encrypted form, encrypted with the shielding key. But the rest of the call is transparent. So the 50 tokens is transparent. Um, and so the enclave now decrypts the AIC to learn what the beneficiary account is. Um, and then it sends a confirmation call like for like it does for trusted calls. So just that Alice can be sure that uh, that she should have her her uh, balance now. And you see on the left side now her on-chain balance is 50. The bonding account has 50, and her private identity has 50 now. She could query that with the trusted getter. Um, but that's not that's out of scope for this diagram. Now she wants to do unshielding. Um, so she calls the worker, and that's now again uh, an opaque call. So the the, the substrate palette does nothing more than just uh, feed it through, proxy it. It's it's opaque. Um, sorry. It just basically forwards like what it considers. Yes. To be yes. It it just it it just forwards the payload. It doesn't know what what this is about. Um, it's just the battle bytes to the. Yes, right? yes, yes. It's it's a, it's a binary blob. That's it. Yeah. Um, so again, the, the 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 worker scans for 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 this trusted call. It decrypts the trusted call, and then it interprets that trusted call. And what it does is actually it decreases the the balance of AIC, which is nothing more than burning, because the the total issuance goes down as well. 
on that shard. Um, yeah, let's ignore shard. Um, and then it sends, and actually I see this diagram is not up to date uh, because the confirm call here is not necessary. Um, well, let me take a note. It's, it's an outdated uh, diagram. Okay, so it, it sends an on-shield funds um, extrinsic. And that is kind of a, uh, well, it's not a sudo extrinsic, it is just a permissioned extrinsic. So only registered enclaves may call this function. Um, so the chain can be sure that only enclaves uh, call or ensures that only enclaves call this. And now um, the contents of this, of this extrinsic is send or send to AOC, so back, that's the beneficiary of the, of the public funds, send 40. And because the enclave decreased AIC by 40, um, it can now send, it can, it, it can now instruct the chain to, to send 40 from, from the uh, bonding account to Alice's public identity. And so our palette will again call the balance transfer sending from, from the bonding account to AOC. And the bonding account, and I mean... It doesn't have to be to AOC, it can be to anyone on the public. It can account. be to anyone, it can be to anyone. Because AOC is the parameter in your, if, if you look here, a AOC is a parameter of that of that uh, trust call, so you can right. you can you can name whatever account. It's just one little detail which is interesting. The bonding account doesn't have a private key. Um, that's kind of a nice little trick we can do because the because the palette can call ba the balances module uh, after after authenticating the the caller um, because. If, if our palette can authenticate enclaves, it can allow any enclave to perform this transaction, to pay on, on behalf of, of that bonding account. And that's, there, there are a, a few more details because as we have multiple workers running, we need to prevent replay. So if, if we have three workers and three workers sent the on-shield funds, then all of a sudden uh, we, will, we will deplete uh, the bonding account. So actually that there is a bit more magic to it than just this, but, but I think um, that, that's about, that, that's what we do now. Is the, do you have questions? The, the, Yoshi, does that, does that very, answer your question? Yeah, very clear. It's, like, it's almost the same design as transferring dots to parachains. It's just an on-call. Yeah. Kind of it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's very similar to Xclaim, to the, to the, to the chain bridge protocol Xclaim. It's, it's, not, it's not so much different. Cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And and that's also why why we think Substrate could be could be very well positioned to do chain uh, bridges because imagine you not only have a light client into your root chain but you can have a light client into any parachain um, and you you could you could actually well I mean. Of course, we will have XCMP uh, sooner or later uh, for that, but we could also bridge to Ethereum. We, we could have an Ethereum light client inside our enclave, and then the enclave provides the integrity that only funds which were spent on one chain will also be spent on the other chain. So kind of the, the, the atomic transaction can be ensured by the enclave. But, and I understand why Web3 didn't jump on it right now, um, this bridge relies on the trust in Intel because we rely on the integrity guarantees of Intel. And that's kind of what, that, that was the reason. It, it's, not, it's not the pure solution. Like, I mean, Zcash is, is a lot more pure in the sense of cryptography. Um, but, the, the reason why I'm, where, where I think the middle ground of trusted execution is interesting is if Intel wants to do a backdoor, or I mean, yeah, let's say, let's assume Intel has a backdoor uh, in any CPU, 
uh, that backdoor also corrupts Zcash because, uh, I mean, zero knowledge proofs are nice, but if you compute them on, on a compromised platform, uh, they are worthless. And, uh, well, not worthless, but I mean, you get the idea. Um, so I, I, I knowledge anymore, whoever has the back door gets to know the details. Is that, that's what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just saying Substrate requires trust in Intel, but we should be aware that Zcash requires trust in Intel as well, mm -hmm. because that's just the, the major platform that Zcash clients will be run on. Um, this is the part where you reveal the curtain and you say like, oh yeah, by the way, we're all trusting Intel. Like it all has the same security. <laughs> it's from pretty much from the ground up. Well, at least you have a diversification of CPUs. You can choose to run Zcash on an ARM CPU, on an AMD CPU. You can, at least you have the choice. With Substrate, you don't have that choice yet. So I, I, I do get the point of kind of uh, not liking that trust uh, model, but it's, uh, I, I think one just has to be careful with, with, uh, with, with, re, with kind of glorifying cryptography, pure cryptography, because in the end it needs to be computed on a, on a physical machine. You get the end of the day, you one should run Zcash or something similar on a, on the TE. Yeah, work. yeah, yeah, okay, but <laughs> that doesn't actually improve the trust model if you if if you take it all the way it through. Sure doesn't. Um, yeah. But I have, I have I have one more stupid question if you could go back to the previous slide just one second yes, before yes. um let me I don't know why So essentially happened. the question is about how the on-chain registry of valid and trusted enclaves is maintained and how what happens if in between a call to from alice to bond a bunch of funds what happens if the enclaves are man in the middle attacked just after that call um if they are man in the middle attacked but what i mean we rely on the guarantees that we have from the light client. So, so a man in the middle attack. What what would be the scenario that you that you see? So she sends she sends the bonding transaction to the uh, to the which is an open transaction to to the node, and it's mm -hmm. seen by everybody. And then the uh, substrate node forwards that block to the light client that runs inside the enclave. Yep. And it's crucial that it only forwards the block information to the trusted enclaves, to the correct enclaves. Because if somebody were to substitute them with, with another enclave, mm, that would be bad. Okay. Right? okay, I will need another slide to go into this. <laughs> I, will, I will answer that. Uh, but this slide here is, is better suited to answer this. Um, Okay, so what exactly is a trusted call, and and what what does it what is it composed of? So um, we have the requester side. We have a trusted call. He, oops, uh, we have a trusted call, and this is nothing more than an an enum which which has. Uh, all, all the calls, all your palette calls that you want to uh, expose with Substrate uh, with their arguments. So a trusted call is nothing more than an enum with, with, with payload. Um, and the payload is just the call, the, the palette call. Um, then we need a nonce because actually if the ciphertext is on chain, anyone could take that ciphertext and send another extrinsic with the same ciphertext again uh, and, and, and we wouldn't notice. So we need, I mean, yeah, I mean, the substrate does that already with a nonce, but that nonce doesn't help us because that's kind of the on-chain nonce. We need an off-chain nonce as well. Um, and 
what we include with the signature, I mean, if, if maybe look, at, let's look at the extrinsic first, because that's what Substrate does. It, it, we, we more or less uh, uh, were a copycat of, of, this, of this concept. Um, in order to reach very small transactions, um, what Substrate does it is it includes more information into the payload which is uh, signed than it really sends along with the transaction. So you have, for example, the, the runtime version and the Genesis hash, which the Genesis hash would be the same in every extrinsic. So you would have a lot of, of uh, redundant information on chain. But still, you want to be sure that this transaction can only be executed on the correct chain. So you just include that information into the payload before signing it, but then you strip it off again uh, when, when sending the extrinsic. Um, and the, what we get by this is small, small extrinsics in, in order to avoid chain bloat. Um, we do something similar. So we have a shard ID, and again, let me go into shards later. Um, but we also have something that is called MR Enclave. And MR Enclave is an Intel SGX way of uh, naming the hash of the Enclave. It's not exactly just the hash of the Enclave, but I, I don't think we need to go in, into too much detail here. It's just the MR Enclave identifies the Enclave. Um, not only the binary, but also the mode which is which it is run in. So, kind of, is it is it is it debug mode? Is it production mode, and so on? Um, so, this is why we can make sure, uh, David, to answer your question. This is how we make sure that uh, only enclaves who are one to one equivalent can can uh, work on, on, this, on this trusted call. Um, the other reason why, why your attack wouldn't work is that another enclave couldn't access the same keys. So the key provisioning only works among enclaves which have the same MR enclave. They, so um, some, we have one worker starting. It will generate all the keys, it will register on chain, uh, and it will start uh, serving this use case. Now another worker comes and says, hey, here, here is my remote at the station, I want to join. Then it asks the first worker to, to provision the keys, and the two perform mutual remote at the station, which is a way, which is a protocol where both authenticate uh, the other, also including Intel at the station services. So they, they just provide at the stations to, to each other and, 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 and they have a, a, a TLS connection between them and they can share the, the keys. Okay. I have more questions about that mutual, mutual at the station, but maybe okay. that's too detailed for now. But we can, we can, we can move on. But okay. if, I if mean, we just... have a spare time, we can come back to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so um, now we have the trusted call signed. It is encrypted, it is, uh, it is sent as one of the arguments of our call, uh, of our pallet call. Um, we call it the, the, the request and we, we file the shard ID together with the request because, well, let me just, well, may, maybe I should, no, I, I I'll, I'll, I'll go to into sharding in a minute. <laughs> uh, there's a cliffhanger on every, on every slide. <laughs> um, okay. Now we, we, we go into the untrusted world of the chain. So we have the, the public key of Alice, which is known to the chain, uh, which has to be able to pay uh, for the fees. Uh, the chain verifies the nonce, the chain, well, uh, you know all this. Um, now, the next step is the light client now takes the ciphertext and the shard ID. The shard ID is plain text. 
um, just remember that for later. So the chain knows what shard the, the, the trusted call uh, is, is meant for. Um, the ciphertext is decrypted with the shielding key and so on. And the MRI enclave is known inside the enclave. The shard ID is also known because it is public. So we can verify the signature of that trusted call signed. We can extract the trusted call, execute it in our STF. And this execute uh, includes all our pallets, um, but, but that's not important here. And every state update is then, is then uh, stored on disk in in an encrypted manner and and as i told you before the there is a confirmation extrinsic including the new hash of of the state of the updated state okay um so we already covered key provisioning i think i think we can skip that but now sharding <laughs> um, so, hey, Brenzi, before you dive in here, we're, we're okay. down to like the last 10 minutes or so. So if you, if you want to okay. do so like how to do the pallets like code-wise or whatever, mm, I, I just wanted to let you know. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we, we, we really went deep. So um, let me see. Let's do a new uh, one next week. Part two. <laughs> well, no, let me, let me finish with that sharding and then we will we will... Because uh, the other thing is actually really available as a tutorial on uh, on substrate.com. Um, okay, so what do we understand by sharding? Um, what substrate offers you is you can have one chain which hosts very different use cases, different MR enclaves. Um, and now I will, I will, if I say trusted computing base or MR enclave or smart contract, that will for now just mean the same. It's just the code that we trust that is executed correctly. Um, as, as a side note, we could in Substrate also instantiate an ink pallet or an EVM pallet and then execute real like smart contracts in the sense of the word. But let's leave that aside for now. Um, so we can have the, the, the worker operator can decide which dApps it will serve. And so it just loads the correct MR enclave, it registers on chain, and you now have a, a registry of very different dApps. That is the first way of sharding um, because one chain can, can host many, but that's not what helps us with scalability as long as we have indirect invocation because if still every request has to hit the chain, that doesn't really help us with, uh, with uh, transaction throughput. We would need direct invocation for that, but that's something we, we don't have implemented yet. Um, the direct invocation, you're talking about sending your transaction directly to the enclave instead of like sending it first to the chain and having it Exactly, okay, exactly. Yeah. And we do have a, a sketch of a concept how we would do that. Um, but it's 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 a non-trivial problem, so it's kind of a major uh, a, a major enhancement of the substrate platform if we go to to a direct invocation, because we need to make sure that all the workers execute the same transactions in the same order, and that's it, yeah I mean it's a distributed system, decentralized system, so that's that's not a simple thing, and we don't want to build a chain on top of the chain and and kind of, <laughs> but. But still, we, I believe it is a lot simpler than, than what blockchain solves because block, the, the blockchain consensus um, doesn't have the integrity guarantees that we have with, with, uh, uh, with SGX. So the simplest protocol that we could have is a master-slave thing where there is a master who says what the order is, and then you have the slaves. But then the next challenge comes, how do you do load balancing? And, but yeah, but that, that's a different topic. And it's something that we haven't implemented yet. But sharding, we have implemented. So now 
the interesting thing here is if you have a use case like Encointer, Encointer has uh, offers you the possibility to to build uh, your own local currency. So on the same system, we will have dozens or thousands of currencies. Now these currencies, they can all have their own shard because the state that a currency operates on is kind of isolated from the others as well. We can still have decentralized exchange among them, but basically you just have different local currencies which mainly trade within themselves, transact within themselves. And that's, that's why in our, in our diagram here, we introduce the possibility that, that, that one trusted computing base, one, one version of that, of that binary can serve multiple shards. And then we need a bonding account for every shard because you can have these shielding and unshielding transactions per shard, per currency, if you like. But that's, I mean, that, that now doesn't really fit the story of, of Encointer because we don't need that there. Um, but that's, this way we can, we can really um, have independent shards operated by different workers. One of the workers could, uh, for example, just decide to only serve the, the local currency uh, in, in his region and, uh, and ignore all the others. And that's perfectly fine. And Cointer, as I said initially, has these four pallets, scheduler, currencies, balances, ceremonies, and Balances and ceremonies should be confidential. Um, on this side, we have the on-chain stuff. On this chain, we have uh, here we have the off-chain stuff. And here you see that there is interaction. So the ceremonies palette needs to be able to query the state of the currencies palette. And the tutorial, which is linked uh, here below, uh, you, you can have a look look at it uh, now that we don't have the time to to go into more detail um, is is showing you what we do i mean it's it's really just a bunch of lines of code that you need to do a wrapper around your palette but let let's let's spend the the rest of the time with questions i think i can well what do i have left no that's that's fine i mean yeah here, that's the testnet that we will build, be building is just a substrate, substrate testnet with two validators and one archive node. Uh, the Encointer worker runs on the hardware, so so this here runs in DigitalOcean, uh, and we have at SCS one SGX hardware, um, which does uh, which uh, operates this worker, and so that's the very simple setup we use for the first substrate testnet. But yeah, uh, I'm open to questions. I have a technical question. I think that you guys went with the uh, Rust SGX Baidu project. Yes, yes. Could, could you uh, elaborate on why you picked that one as opposed to the uh, doing it in C or doing it mm. uh, with okay. the Fortinix SGX yeah, framework? Well, f first, why why didn't we do it in C? Um, we, to be honest, uh, the whole Substrate project, I also acquired because I wanted to bring my team up to speed with Rust. So that was kind of a strategic decision. But I also think um, that Rust is the better language for Enclave code than C because you have better, uh, well, better, <laughs> a better language to avoid certain, certain errors that you can, that you can, mistakes that you can do, uh, that shoot, shoot holes in your security. Um, but the other advantage is that we wanted to be compatible with substrate palettes, 
which are written in Rust right now. What we did at first is we even instantiated a WASM interpreter inside the Enclave that we could, let's say, we, we could execute uh, what, whatever palette which is uh, compilable to WASM. So even if there will be soon other languages. But today what we are face, facing is Rust. Palettes are written in Rust. Um, and now the, the question, why not Fortinex? Why did we use the, it's been renamed actually. It's now, uh, the, so the Baidu SDK is now named Tclave and it is an Apache incubator uh, project. Um, Fortinex took the design decision to write everything in Rust. So even, even the, even, even the, the things that actually the Intel SDK would provide, because the Intel SDK is written in C. And Tclave chose to use the Intel SDK as a base and wrap it uh, for, to, be, uh, to, to work with Rust. Um, our reasoning of choosing Tclave is that Intel will always be quicker with security fixes than Fortinex. And so we believe that it is a more, well, I, th I think both ways can work. But I, I sympathize with, if, if, if we depend on Intel, then we can very well just use their SDK. And that's probably the best source, uh, source of, of, of truth <laughs> Got it. at the moment. OK, makes sense. But having said that, probably, uh, to be honest, I haven't worked with Fortinex. I don't know about uh, the developer experience uh, with Fortinex. It's much nicer as a newcomer, for sure. I am... Um, but I but that holds well, all the way, I don't know. But it, yeah. as a beginner, it's super easy. If you know Rust, yeah. it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. T-Clave is very complicated. Because it, it wraps everything, it and it is not it is not very nicely documented. You you basically just work based on sample code, so it is. It, but the the developers are very quick in responding, so it's a, it's kind of it was very helpful. It's the doc, documentation is is so so la la, but but uh, the the guys are helpful. Nick asked in the chat, I'd like to hear about mutual attestation. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so a mutual attestation is, so re remote attestation first is convincing anybody at a, a remote location that a hardware is genuine, well, well, all these guarantees and the code is executed. Now that anybody could very well be just another enclave and now, that's what we what 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 mutual remote attestation is. You take you take the two enclaves, they each request remote attestation from Intel attestation service, send each other this this uh, attestation over over a uh, TLS connection. So so you can really the enclaves can directly open open a TLS connection uh, with each other. And that also avoids the, the, the man in the middle um, because they challenge each other. So kind of uh, one, one sends a challenge to the other. That one includes the challenge in, in the quote, send, sending it to Intel attestation services. And, and so it's no, the challenge doesn't go to IAS if I'm, if I'm correct. But you know that the challenge is well can only be responded by 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 an enclave, because the key there is ah oh yeah I think that that's how it works. You have you have an ECDSA key which is uh, created inside each enclave, which is included in the report of IAS, and whatever is signed with this key uh, comes from that enclave. That's actually what we use if we, for us, we don't just don't use uh, ECDSA uh, if, if we reg register on-chain. What we use is, is the, the public key of, of the on-chain account. So it's, it's an ED25519 key. So I don't know if I understood you right. Maybe I did. Is is it the case that with mutual attestation, like 
let's say you and I both have SGX enclaves and like, instead of going to Intel and asking them to verify, like we can somehow mutually verify each other. And no, like, you still need Intel attestation services in the process. So what do we gain or what does it allow us to do? Um, it just allows us to do, well, if, if, we, if we want to provision keys, we want to be sure that the other party is, yeah. is genuine. We yeah. could actually do it if we, if we just query the chain. But when we, when we set, we, we developed redundancy before we developed uh, uh, the light client. So before we didn't have a trusted way of querying the, the on-chain registry. But today we could actually do some kind of mutual remote attestation, not with IAS, but with the blockchain. Because we, we previously already uh, had verified the attestations. Yeah. So actually it's a good point. Now, now we could do it without, without relying on IAS. Uh, or at least not at that time, but yeah, it, it doesn't matter so much, I think. One other thing that came across this, the chat, Steve's wondering your opinion about Ledger HQ. It's a GitHub repo, Ledger HQ slash Bolos Enclave. I don't know if you Ledger heard HQ, yeah, Bolos. Um, I mean, to be honest, I heard about it, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I don't have an opinion. It's, uh, hi. Hey. Uh, so yeah, it was super interesting. My brain is completely melted. And, uh, <laughs> I'm very excited to research more about uh, this topic. So while, while you were um, talking, uh, um, I think I had also heard about uh, something from Ledger and uh, Bolas is their proprietary um, operating system. And so yep. apparently they've built an SGX compatible enclave. Uh, from what I understand, it's, it's a virtual machine that you can run on an untrusted computer uh, to have, uh, yeah, SGX compatible enclave. So yep. I was just wondering, like, how does it compare to your solution? And okay, okay, uh, yeah. Now, now I remember. Now I remember. Mm. I think what they do is actually key custody in in uh, SGX, right? Um, and if I'm not mistaken, what they do is, um, or what you could do with something like that, that's something that we have proposed as well. Uh, and, and that's kind of remote signing for validators because validators need a hotkey uh, to sign blocks. And whoever could compromise that machine could use that hotkey not to not to send funds not to uh, kind of transact the, the the tokens but could provoke slashable behavior and now um, you could of course have this uh, hotkey inside SGX but that by itself doesn't protect you because if SGX signs whatever payload you provide to it, you can still provoke um, uh, slashable behavior. So you would actually, and then we are at the point where what, what we did so far comes to help because if you have a light client inside SGX and the hot key, the, the validator key, uh, the session, session key it is called um, inside uh, that enclave, you can verify blocks before signing them. And, and so, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure what Ledger does there, but I think they are going into that direction of, of uh, custody of, uh, of keys with, with SGX. Okay, all right. I will uh, dive into that. Uh bit more as well I'm very curious <laughs> yeah all right seems like a good place to to wrap it up thanks a lot Brenzi for telling us all about your stack and all about uh tees in general very informative for me yes yeah, was an interesting one thanks for all That's your super great thank you so much for taking the time yeah. awesome thanks for your questions mm -hmm. cool. well, it was a, a very educated audience I think <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you probably already knew a lot about the topic. Nope. I, I learned a lot for sure. Well, some, some of you, yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Next week we have Alex Simon from Subsocial coming back to tell us about a few of the palettes they've been restructuring recently. And then the second half of next week is open. So if you have something you'd like to share or that you're curious about and want to request someone to share, just let us know in the, in the riot chat. See you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye.